and I'm here at the Willy Lit Festival in Williamstown talking to kind of a long lost buddy, uh, Stephen Conti. Thanks, Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Stella. Now, you're a novelist, two novels, your most recent one. Well, the first one, did you ring the Prime Minister's? Prime my, Minister? I was lucky enough that my first novel, The Zookeeper's War, was awarded the inaugural Prime Minister's Literary Award. Wow. At a time when uh, it was actually even worth more outrageous $100,000 tax free. So. Where do you go, as a first time novelist, where do you go from there? What could you possibly do and win that would ever match? Well, yeah, you're like right, that? it's only downhill pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think that's a. Has, but are you quite happy with that kind of. Well, I picked early, that's great. Yeah, that, it, was a, it was a gift. It, look, it, it, yes, it was a double edged sword because it, it made me actually overconfident about. I thought, oh, well, you know, I am a novelist and look, I've got this public acclamation and therefore I just need to uh, uh, write what I like. Well, that turned out to be a bit of a mistake. I've, I've, I'm the author of four novels and only two of them published. And it seems that when I set something in Australia, it just uh, doesn't hit the mark. So ah. there you are, uh, I'm back to the Second World War. So, but congratulations on winning that PM award. I mean, come mm. on, there's very few of us that yeah, can go every, around saying that. It, you know. it, whoever yes. lived the dream, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So with your second one, The Tolstoy Estate, give us a quick picture. Well, I say only slightly glibly that the Tolstoy estate is a dark Teutonic version of MASH. Mm. It's uh, the story of Paul Bauer, who is a German military surgeon who in ni late 1941 is part of a unit that uh, uh, occupies the former Tolstoy estate to the southwest of Moscow. And there he encounters the fiery acting chief custodian uh, Katarina Trubetskaya, who proceeds to give the Germans hell, and so it's uh, it's surgery, it's cold, it's uh, repartee, and uh, it's. Tell me about Kat Katarina. Mm. Is, it, is it male or female? She's Katarina is uh, is a uh, an early Russian revolutionary feminist, oh. and she has washed up, as it were, uh, in the countryside. Uh, almost as a refugee from Stalinism. So she's, you know, part of that early ideo ideologically uh, idealistic first efflorescence of the Russian Revolution. And, you know, she, her, her husband has been murdered by Stalin. And so she finds herself there with resentments against her own regime, but which she actually, in a sense, takes out on these hideous Germans. She just would like the country to be de delivered from Stalinism, but it did it have to be by these, uh, you know, Depraved. I Nazis. feel like I really like her. Mm. Is she, did you enjoy writing yeah, a character yeah. well, like that? Well, of course, it's always good to write mm. a really powerful, strong woman. So tell me, oh, yes, you say that it's always good to write a really powerful, strong woman. Men, but not many men do that. Mm. Come on, you'd have to agree with that. Wouldn't uh, you? Well, we'll just sort of agree. Lovely yeah. session with Jock Sarong. He's oh, got a powerful oh, yeah. female protagonist. Jock is a different kettle of fish mm. altogether. He's. Um, and now, you were just, I've got two questions. Just want to park your session with Jock for a minute. What sort of research did you do about Moscow? Did you actually go there? And did you go to surgery as well? Well, you know, it's that, the oh. Moscow part, that's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, oh. That's definitely reimagined. So that that's book learning. Right. So there was uh, going to the, and reading memoirs. I mean, the terrific thing for historical fiction is to read memoirs because it's got that novelistic detail, those small concrete details that really bring a story alive. And so I learned all about that Russian intelligentsia that, that went into the 20s with so much hope and passion. Uh, so that was, that was uh, where the, the research was from by and large for that part of the story. As for surgery, you know, one of the reasons I'm attracted to this, I'm the son of a retired nurse and uh, I have a stepfather who was uh, a doctor and a surgeon. And, you know, it's really part of my imaginary. Uh, and yet one of my late discoveries in life was that I'm actually quite squeamish. <laughs> like, you know, as a 20, yeah. 20 year old, I went to Berlin and, and actually talked my way and seeing bodies being dissected at Berlin University and you know I, I was aware that something might go wrong and that was lucky because at the five minute mark I had to get out of there you know so yeah um, you were just in the session with Jock Song about epic novels mm. so yours 
what, what constitutes an epic novel? And I'm sure that was a question that was asked. Yeah, it's it's to do with, is it really quotidian daily life? Or... <gasps> you used the word quotidian, and I hope somebody would use that today. I have no idea what that means. Actually, I was a, a tautology, I think. Quotidian daily life is a tautology. Quotidiano, daily. Uh... Oh, so daily, daily life. Yeah, exactly. All oh, right. Quotidian. Yeah, so it's daily life. So uh, is it a novel about our daily lives or no. is it a, a, a novel, no, in this case about the lives that people have lived epically? And, you know, one of my attractions to the Second World War is precisely that, uh, that you know, ordinary people got to live these extraordinary stories. You know, I mean, millions of people who, in a sense, got to live what could, have, uh, could easily be marketed as a major emotional picture. Now, you ready for some literary sound? It would have to be. Oh, is that fate? The question's fallen to the floor. Recommend a good writing book. Well, I'm going to recommend two books, okay? One is a, 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 appropriately called The Writing Life by Annie Dillard. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so there's, that is an extraordinary poetic book about, about being an author and I highly recommend it. Um, there's, for a more uh, craft-oriented book, um, I'd recommend something by an um, American editor and novelist called Sol Stein. And I'm going to pull up short here because it's got a fairly uh, unmemorable title that I can't remember, but just Sol Stein. He's the first um, writer about writing that I've actually uh, encountered, actually discussed how to do suspense, how literally to write suspense. What are the mechanics of it? Uh, which is, you know, it's about not so much withholding information as the artful elaboration and trailing details like a matador or trails a, a cave. So, you know, the, those are real practical things. Okay, where were you? Sol Stein. Stein on writing is the book. Yeah. Um, he's a very macho, machismo, uh, so, yeah, so maybe not to one's taste, swashbuckling style of editor, author, uh, but still, uh, no nonsense about the craft, and that's what I admired about that book. Interesting what you were saying about building suspense. Never thought about like suspense before. Yeah. How, how you write suspense. Like, well, you know, it's different to mystery. And, and that was the key message I took away, that it's not about just withholding information. That, and you sometimes see it in a, a student book, uh, that uh, a student work, a short story or something, that uh, the ca character's adventures will unfold and you'll find out on the last night line, oh, it, it's all a dog. Oh, yeah. You know, and it really, this, it, that's not very interesting to discover on the last line. It's meant to be a sting in the tail. But actually, to write a short story about what it's like to be a dog and make that clear in the first sentence, that would be interesting. Oh, so that's suspense. Well, look, that's, that's, I think yeah. the, the, the key to it is actually letting the information out, some of the information out early, so that the reader knows that something's afford, has something to feel suspenseful about yes. in that sense. Yes. If you know someone is going to die, well, who's it going to be? Rather than the death just coming as a shock. Yeah, yeah. Mm. One more. Yep. What's this? Did you always want to be a writer? Um, I feel like it, mm. that's a hard yes from you. It, oh, that's interesting that you should say that yeah. because it is a hard yes, which I would actually say is maybe a privilege of being male. I don't know, I'm, gen I'm gen <laughs> generalising that I know, speaking to a lot of women writers, that, that there were stages in which they had to feel as though they had, could give themselves permission. Yes. Because society hadn't leapt out and given them permission. And I must say that that is, you know, one of the sense that at the age of 16, when I was sitting in a boys' boarding school and had this epiphany, you know, I was their writer, I didn't ever question but that was something that I could at least understand. Yeah, so, I hear what you're saying. To, you know, a lot of people approach life, they don't know what they want to do. And so it's a real gift. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not something you get paid for no. while you pursue it. 
We just... Unless you win the Prime Minister's prize. And uh, that would presuppose <laughs> you had the wisdom to invest it correctly. Oh. Did you do that? Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I wasn't. I didn't split, spend it on booze. <laughs> booze and women, bad no, women. No, no, I didn't spend on that. Oh, but that's I, a waste yeah, if you don't do that. What I, did you spend it on? I did spend it on adventures. Uh, for example, I, I walked and then rode the length of Italy. Oh, so, you wow. Know. Did a novel come out of it? Yeah, it's the material's lingering there. So, oh. yeah. So. Stephen Conte, it's been so lovely catching up with you again, and thank you so much for coming on my channel. Thanks so much, Stella. Keep up the good work. Thanks.